Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Talha Jamal Pirzada. I'm a lecturer in material science, the University of Oxford. And on behalf of the Oxford Pakistan program, I welcome all of you to the inaugural uh, Ilama Muhammad Iqbal lecture being hosted here today at Oxford University. The lecture is part of the OPP flagship lecture series, which focus on key themes that Iqbal worked on during his life. Professor Adil Malik, who's the academic lead of the program, will discuss the broader rationale, aims, and objectives of this lecture series. The Oxford Pakistan program is a homegrown university-wide initiative set up by Oxford academics, students, and alumni to address three key issues. Firstly, to improve the underrepresentation of Pakistani scholars at Oxford. Secondly, to promote academic exchange between Pakistan and Oxford. And thirdly, to broaden academic conversations on Pakistan. This lecture has been made possible by the generous support of the Dada Boy Foundation, Abdul Ghani Dada Boy, one of Oxford's alumni and a trustee of the Dada Boy Foundation is here with us today. Today's lecture is being live streamed in 20 universities in Pakistan, all across Pakistan, in different corners of Pakistan. Through this initiative, we're reaching out to over 200,000 students in Pakistan who would be able to listen to and benefit from Professor Wael Halak's talk. These universities include Karakrum University in Gilgit, Baltistan, Azad Jammu Kashmir University in Kashmir, Balochistan University of Science, Engineering and Technology, Ulam Ishaq Khan University Institute, for, Institute of Engineering, Science and Technology, Islamia College University, Malakand University, Shaheed Benazir Bhutto University, Deer, in Khyber Pakhtunkhwa province. In Islamabad, the Pakistani, the participating universities include Qaid Azam University, National University of Modern Languages, Zabist, Nast, Paid, Barrier University. In Punjab, we have with, with us the Government College Lahore, the Lahore University of Management Sciences, Punjab University, and Sargoda University. Finally, in Sindh, we have the Sindh University Jam Shoro, Shah Abdul Latif Patai University, and Dada Boy Institute of Higher Education. Apologies for this long list. We want to recognize and welcome all those participants who are joining us remotely today. This lecture is also being broadcast through Pakistani's popular English radio channel, Power FM 99 and DBTV, reaching millions of people. The spirit behind this engagement is to include public sector universities from far corners of Pakistan and to make them part of the conversation today. Many of these universities are located in remote areas and underprivileged areas of Pakistan where students are being given the unique opportunity to connect with us today. By reaching out to university, universities in far-flung areas of Pakistan, um, the Oxford Pakistan program is also trying to surpass the internal academic hierarchy that Pakistan um, has to offer. This is a humble effort of setting a new model for academic engagement that is at once global due to it being hosted at Oxford, yet locally rooted in a very authentic way. I would now like to invite Professor Adil Malik to introduce our esteemed speaker, Professor Wael Halak. Thank you, Talha. I realize that I'm standing between you and the esteemed speaker, but please allow me a few minutes to introduce the broader vision behind initiating this lecture series, because it's the inaugural series uh, lecture. For the last 17 years that I've been serving as an Oxford academic, I have attended countless lectures, and many of these were named after intellectual giants. I've long desired for there to be a series that is dedicated after a major intellectual figure of the East. In Western academia, we often bemoan the lack of diversity, not just of faces, but also perspectives. A frequent lament is that our reading lists are too Western-centric and that they do not adequately cover the intellectual contributions of the Global South. The Alam Iqbal lecture series is a humble effort to fill this gap. Muhammad Iqbal is one of the most influential Muslim thinkers of the 20th century. Revered as the poet philosopher of the East, 
Iqbal's poetry in Urdu and Persian is considered as one of the finest expressions of Muslim literary and philosophical tradition in contemporary times. Much can be said about his intellectual legacy, and I'm no expert of Iqbal. But for me, as a political economist, Iqbal represents a symbol of both resistance and reform. He provides an active critique of both external and domestic power structures. Iqbal opposed colonial rule and foreign subjugation in its many guises. At the same time, he critiqued tyrannical rule in Muslim society, which is often hereditary and monarch. He opposed landlords for their exploitative hold over the peasantry, advocated the rights of the poor, criticized established religious classes for doing the ruler's bidding and selling their pen to the powerful. He critiqued many isms, including capitalism and socialism. Iqbal's intellectual court, therefore, represents an active struggle against injustice. In trying to surpass and transcend the unjust structures facing us, Iqbal locates the self as the vantage point from where it is possible to transcend those structures. For him, the struggle for sovereign existence starts from a rediscovery of the self. He was keenly aware that the exploitative structures of power, including those based on colonialism, tend to reshape the individual as their subject or object. Instead, Iqbal wanted people who are subjugated and excluded to shape their own future in their own terms. The moral and ethical dimensions are therefore central to his intellectual paradigm. And he is unapologetic about the potential of both Islam and the Muslim civilizational experience in guiding us towards, towards creating a more just and humane social order. Iqbal is thus ever more relevant for our existential challenges. He tries to awaken and inspire the young generations of the Muslim world. He carries the best filament, the Abrahamic tradition, a filament that can be used to foster inter-religious dialogue that our world needs so badly today. He can also provide the intellectual platform for an authentic and constructive engagement between the Islam and the West. For all these reasons, I'm immensely delighted that we are launching today the annual Allama Muhammad Iqbal lecture series, which will hopefully become a permanent fixture of Oxford University's academic calendar in years to come. There is no better scholar to inaugurate this series than Professor Wael Halla. He is the Avalon Foundation Professor of Humanities in Columbia University, where he teaches ethics, law, and political thought. Widely considered as one of the foremost contemporary authorities on Islamic law, Professor Hallak has made foundational contributions to the field through several award-winning books, many of which cannot be listed um, in their entirety because of time. Uh, but some of his best-known works are Authority, Continuity and Chain in Islamic Law, The Impossible State, Islam, Politics, and Modernity's Moral Predicament, and restating Orientalism, a critique of modern knowledge, amongst many others. His work has been hugely influential, widely debated, and translated in multiple languages. Ladies and gentlemen, please allow me to welcome Professor Wael Hallad. Is there a way to move left? I'm a bit of a Luddite. Thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, pleasure to be here. Um, thank you, um, Adil, for uh, the kind, overly kind words and for the wonderful invitation. Uh, it's a, it's a Multi-layered invitation has been, they have been keeping me quite busy here and for a whole week. Um, I, so, uh, louder, oh, absolutely, yes. Yeah, I, I usually worry about being too loud. Um, so th thank you for, for, uh, for the invitation and for all you have done to, uh, uh, make this trip um, so auspicious and, and, and fruitful. And uh, I want to thank also the Dada Boy Foundation for the support of this uh, important uh, series. 
um, it is a, also a distinct honor to be performer of the first inaugural lecture. Um, in honoring the memory and achievements of Alama Muhammad Iqbal, there are a few things more befitting than to talk about a peer of his. One who, like Iqbal himself, sprung, and by the way, we can have another lecture on, on Iqbal and the man I'm going to be talking about in terms of comparison, but we will not do this today. I'm going to be interested in the other man because we know a lot about Muhammad um, Iqbal and his achievement. Uh, so uh, 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 that the, it is barely more befitting than to, to talk about uh, uh, this uh, other fellow um, who singled also, like Iqbal, a, an exceptional um, instance in Islamic civilization, especially by Western scholarship, because he appeared to be distinctly more rational than the Islamic run of the mill. Uh, the exceptionalism has always struck me as an interesting um, performance of Orientalism. Although my lecture today is not directly about the extent of rationality and rationalistic thinking in Ibn Khaldun, category is already problematic in my mind, it will emerge that Ibn Khaldun, our focus for today, uh, Ibn Khaldun's ways of reasoning were no different from any other Islamic uh, uh, thinker, including those in the middle rung of things. Let me get to my business. I think it is a truism in modern political theory that material affluence or the development of a robust economy is a precondition for the rise of successful politics. For after all, the rise of the powerful modern state and its cognate modern empire are often explained in terms of economic power that enables militarization and the development of various coercive tools that make political and other forms of domination possible. In fact, there is the argument that the rise of a polity to the rank of an imperial force stands in direct correlation with its fortunes in accumulating wealth and financial resources. This is standard narrative. I think any reasonable person in modernity would think that this is, there is nothing new in it. One can assume, therefore, that on this conception, money, affluence, and wealth are associated with the rise and maintenance of strong states and empires and their absence leads to weakness or collapse. So far, so good. It is also a truism, following Marx and many others, that upon the rise of such a capital-based capital society, a relatively thin elite stands to command the main financial resources. What is most interesting here is that the more capitalist and rich the state becomes, the richer and more affluent these effectively ruling elites become. I think it is only by articulating this as a contrast to the Khaldunian theory that we begin to appreciate his claims that the exact opposite is true, namely that affluence, wealth, and too much money in fact lead to the collapse of imperial force. All is as is well known, Ibn Khaldun argued that the dawla's lifespan, dawla is, the, is, the, is not the state, uh, so for those who know Arabic, modern Arabic, it means the state today. For Ibn Khaldun, it's meant effectively the executive uh, branch or executive power within Islamic governance before the 19th century. Ibn Khaldun argued that the dawla's lifespan is mostly three or four generations which he defined as roughly extending to 100 or 120 years. The first generation, coming from rough tribal cultures, because these are the warriors, are tough fighters and dedicated to the common cause of the tribal entity from which they hail. This common cause he famously called Asabiya, for those who know anything about The second generation, begins to lose this asabiya and sense of common ambition. He's, he says exactly 
فتنكسر ثورة العصبية بعض الشيء little bit due to a transformation from rough and rough style of life بداوة وشظف العيش to comfortable and luxurious living now the comfortable and luxurious living is the word you need to remember it's called taraf so it will be mentioned in the lecture many 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 times taraf yeah, usually in my Arabic classes, I say repeat three times so you can make sure that you know. But I'm not going to do this to you today. In this generation, one strong man has monopoly over power to the, exclusi to the exclusion of his associates. But it must remain true that while this generation has absorbed much of the kind of city values, urban values, Hadara, he calls it, of luxury and comfort, it has not totally forgotten the values of the previous generation. The third generation, by contrast, entirely forgets this initial force, forcefulness and enthusiasm, and instead care only about comfortable and luxurious living. You know, the spoiled little princes roaming around. In other words, they reach the state of becoming parasites, or as he says, and I quote, no better than dependent children. They lose their prowess and sense of asabiya and effectively become soft cowards. Hmm? At that stage, threats surround the ruler who normally seeks the assistance of strong men against these threats. Whatever his supporters, whether his supporters win or lose against external threats, he and his dynasty are doomed anyway because one or the other, that is, the supporters or the foes will impose their power over the political void and take over with a new sense of asabiya backed by coercive force. This can be observed actually inductively from Islamic history itself if you read just tarikh work. By the fourth generation, the dawla and the actual dynasty that sustains it tend to vanish. This trajectory corresponds to another, which, is, which, which identifies five stages that are characterized by a different set of behaviors, by different kinds of ethics. What concerns me here is the fifth stage, the final one, where the dawla, this executive political military power, where the Dawla's leaders are preoccupied with luxurious and wasteful, wasteful ways of living, israf wa tabdir, resulting in the acquisition of meek character and fit for rule. Since we are speaking of Dawla as the executive organ, to use a modern, modern word, it makes sense that a soft and pampered army and military le leaders are no leaders at all. I should say at this point that it is central to understanding Ibn Khaldun's ideas that we take sufficient account of his central concepts of Malaka, which he generally takes for granted. Malaka, I, I, I hope you will not think that this is going to turn into an Arabic lesson, but I have to use these terms. Yesterday I spent two hours speaking why is it, it is important to use the original terms rather than translation, which will actually mislead. So Malaka, for our thinker, is a habit formation, it's a habit formation that engenders a second nature attitude. He calls it khulqan wa it becomes part of your nature that defines how one knows, understands, and does things in the world with all the attendant behaviors that, that come with it as a matter of routine and, and just normal, uh, ordinary kind of attitude. You don't think about it too much. You just do it because that's the way to do things. But these are all acquired things through Malaka. Malaka, in other words, is a full-fledged embodiment, to use an anthropological term. It can build a moral, anti-moral, or a moral character. So you have a whole range. You can make, through Malaka, you can create corrupt people, totally corrupt. Ibn Khaldun puts it straightforward. Al-Taraf, we know what Taraf now it is, do you remember? Al-Taraf being spoiled, decadent, 
الترف من عوائق الملك luxury is an impediment for good government that's a truism that's a rule maxim to live in taraf is to be habituated as second nature to the routine of it which through malaka becomes formative or rather performative of a particular character one that is soft and thus cowardly which is the exact opposite of what an executive leader should be. Note here that Ibn Khaldun makes taraf a natural source of decay in the business of ruling and does not use it in any totalizing or universal way. Just as old age is the natural phase for human decline into disease, weakness, and eventual death, taraf represents the natural stage of political decline and degeneration. Taraf is thus the genetically, so to speak, the genetically natural cause of the political death of the dawla. The question then becomes, which of the two theories I have started my lecture with is valid? Or are they both valid? Each within its own context, time and, and, and or times and preconditions. What I want to do today is to try to make sense of the two narratives to illustrate the fundamental problems that are facing that we are facing in modernity regarding the sets of relationship between affluence on the one hand and power and subject formation in modernity on the other. But let me stay with Ibn Khaldun for, for, for a while. My first simple question is this. What is the exact range of Ibn Khaldun's theory? That is, what are its limits and fields of play and applicability? I think Ibn Khaldun is speaking about one fairly specific domain and its periphery, where affluence and government operate. To be identified first is the ruling class, by which I mean the members of the dynastic power, the Dawla. As can be readily seen in Ibn Khaldun's text, in the first generation, it would seem that as an expression of Asabiyya, there is a pack of prominent men who work together. In the second generation, one of them subjugates the rest and renders them subordinate to his supreme rule. But irrespective of this power-based certification, we are still speaking of dynastic members uh, and their dynastic associates. The Sultan, his uncles, nephews, brothers-in-law, uh, mothers, sisters, daughters, and the generals and commanders, the viziers, senior secretaries, and advisors, and the rest of them. They were, by the way, all of these people were always working together. When we say sultan, no sultan was operating solo in any country. There's, a, there's at least the mother there. You, know, you have to watch out for that. Here, Ottoman mothers killed sometimes their own sons for political reasons, so you can, you know. Here, one cannot even speak of the chief qadis or the muftis or the ulama in general, for they are not part of this dynastic constellation. The periphery for Ibn Khaldun is the civic elites that, 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 the, that the dynasty surrounds itself with. There are also susceptible, these are also susceptible to the corruptions of, uh, uh, of affluence, wealth, and soft ways of life. The ra'aya, meaning the population, the general population in the sense of people, right? Because as I was, uh, was saying for two hours yesterday, you cannot use the word population without having so all sorts of ideological, uh, you know, I shouldn't so now uh, kind of contradicts myself. I, that's why population is a very tricky term, but people living in society, so to speak, with society also problematic. No. I don't know really how to speak because all these are translated terms and they are all dangerous. Um, the ra'aya do emulate ru the, the ruler in his habits and indulgences, but they are never at the center of the Khaldunian gaze. This is very important to remember. The Dawla, as a dynastic power inhabiting Umran, meaning this civilization he's talking about, civilization, uh, building, uh, is, is the core of attention Ibn Khaldun's theorization. 
One can argue that the Khaldunian Dawla thus provides an excellent starting point for discerning qualitative differences between modern and pre-modern rule. And that is part, part of the, one of the main reasons for this lecture. Right? This is to, to kind of speak about two models of governance. It is in fact the difference that may provide an ex explanation for the contrast I opened my lecture with. But let me explain as I go. It is important to understand that the Khaldunian Dawla is the function of the executive or that uh, the executive is in fact the function of the Dawla. The Khaldunian Umran and Hadara, the city life, the complex city life, like the, what he had in mind, something like Cairo, Baghdad and Damascus, these are the cities that he knew, are not to be understood as civilization in the Western sense. This is intrusion on the, this is why I say translation is a dangerous business. Hadara means simply these cities. If you can imagine how Cairo was when Ibn Khaldun was roaming around in it, when he visited, uh, uh, that's what he meant. But rather, but it's not civilization in the Western sense, but rather material and cultural construction of imperial cities, which allowed the flourishing of learning, but also where wealth and accumulation of capital find their context and location. If the Khaldunian Hadara and Umran are to be seen uh, as a civilization, a problematic term, as I said, then how would we define the Hajsonian a venture of Islam as world civilization when the Dawla and its associated Imran and Hadara collapse. So if they collapse every about it, it means what Islam was collapsing every 20 years or 100 years, it doesn't make sense. So we can Im immediately exclude this Rosenthal's translation or through our three volumes that it is Hadara is civilization. We must understand then that Ibn Khaldun was not theorizing about what we call today the social order. For this was not at the center of his attention. In the Khaldunian narrative, this order is multifaceted and nuanced and cannot be seen to have one uniform color or form. Ibn Khaldun did not know what society is or was, because there was none. For this concept is, as I have been arguing for the past few years, is is, is literally modern and the, the, the product of the state. For him, what we think of a society today was made of segregate but interconnected parts, never a product of the dawla or of any form of politics as we know it today. For Ibn Khaldun, society was made of extended families and clans, of crafts and professor, uh, professions, sana'i wa uloom, he called it, each profession had to, to, to uh, uh, develop by necessity its own ethic due to habit-forming behavior. Ibn Khaldun also already understood as modern neuroscience is now discovering that human behavior is deeply affected by repetitive performances and that habits of mind and body are formed by such repetition. Due to the nature of selling, buying, bargaining and quest for material profit, merchants, he tells us, are characterized by a lower grade of ethical conduct than others. He's saying this, not me. Such as the ulama and even the ruling class. This is especially true of the smaller mer merchants who strive to build their wealth by uh, uh, any means possible. فَكَانَتْ رَدَاءَةُ تِلْكَ الْخُلُقِ عِنْدَهُمْ أَشَدْ However, rich, rich merchants, especially those who inherited great wealth from their families tend to be more ethical and socially responsible because they do not need to resort to deceit or fraud to make money. Their businesses are already strong enough and all too well established to make profit without, without such means. فَيَكُونُ ذَلِكَ فِيهِمْ نَادِرًا وَأَقَلُّ مِنْ نَادِرٍ It is telling that the need to rise to this ethical stature is precipitated by this merchant's class ambition to build a good social and political name with a view to associating with the political leadership of the Dawla, Ahl Dawla. For there is a common interest between the two. In good times, these merchants make money and, and, and protect their interests by virtue of the protections afforded by the Ahl Dawla. But in bad times, 
the latter draw on these merchant, merchants' capital by borrowing from them for military campaigns, among other things. I should note that it is this type of civic society, the higher merchant class, that tends to be involved in the third stage of decline and decadence along with Ahl al-Dawla. By contrast, the ulama, because they have a different habit formation, notice the, the emphasis on ethics here, because they have a different habit formation, are said to be much more ethical in their conduct since they are the farthest of all people from politics. That's Ibn Khaldun speaking. These are powerful statements. And this is part due to the fact that the, by the nature of their professions, they are not involved in the quest of accumulating power or wealth. وهم لشرف بضاعتهم أعزة على الخلق. Now it is quite important here to emphasize one of the key premises of Ibn Khaldun's theory, a premise that has largely been neglected in analyzing his writings. This is the premise that it is in the very nature of mulk, of rulership, that it is prone to taraf the profuse enjoyment of luxury and comfortable ways of living. In fact, he gives this as a, as, as a foundational premise in the 11th section of chapter three, book one. As I have mentioned, he explicitly says, Inna min mulki taraf It is in the nature of mulk to indulge in, uh, in it's like nature, right? indulge in, in, in this decaying luxury or the luxury that causes decay. But why should Taraf be so responsible for the collapse of the Dawla? It is, I repeat, because Taraf becomes a way of living, a habit, a malaka, that fashions the subjectivities of the ruler and his associates. Taraf makes them soft and takes away from them, from their subjective constitution, the crucial, the crucial characteristic of prowess and determination, where well, he calls it ba's, this prowess, determination, and willfulness. Once the ruler and his men lose ba's, they cease to be fit for rule, this making them weak and vulnerable, etc., etc., as I've been describing. And so Ibn Khaldun is not speaking of what I call the civic order, the social order that he, as, uh, that, that he was well aware of, uh, uh, to have been commanded by the Sharia and Sufi ethics. Muhammad Khaldun was both a jurist and a Sufi. He wrote uh, on jurisprudence and Sufism as well. It is precisely this order which allowed the continuity throughout a millennium and more of the Hudsonian venture of Islam, this big idea that, um, that, 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 that Hudson kind of captured in, in, in ways that we can at least use analytically here. Or if you will, the Dar al-Islam as a as, as, uh, um, world cultural complex. It allowed a long series of dawlas to come and go, all under the command of the Sharia and Tasawwuf, and the enduring institutions they have sustained, be they the madrasa, the markets, the waqfs, building streets, khanqah, zawiyas, religious orders, artisanal guilds, family and communal structures, and the like. All of this was the Sharia, and not only that, that everything that I enumerated much more was imbued with the Sharia ethos and ethic. If we go by the central concept of Malaka in Ibn Khaldun, a crucial concept in any social and political analysis, and one that Ghazali had articulated to a state of art in his Ihya, Ihya Ulum al -Din, we will immediately realize that affluence and money as such are not central concepts of analysis in terms of decline. To put it differently, when there is Sharia and Tasawwuf ruling as central domains, when there is Sharia and Tasawwuf ruling as central domains, as I have argued in the impossible state, then money and affluence and thus decadence of taraf are not operational factors anymore, meaning operational factors of decline anymore. This is because they cannot be allowed under the influence of the technologies of the self to lead to decadence, be it moral or physical, money or no money, 
and Muslims had lots of it since the beginning uh, of Islam, cannot lead to political decline because of this threat. But in fact, may well be due to these technologies, a source of power and strength. In one place, very crucial paragraph, one of the most crucial paragraphs in the Muqaddimah, Ibn Khaldun explicitly tells us that prowess, pass of the Rashidun caliphs, of the rightly guided caliphs, as some people know them in English, for example, increased precisely because of their total absorption in these technologies. وَلَا تَسْتَنْكِرَ ذَلِكَ بِمَا وَقَعَ فِي الصَّحَابَةِ مِنْ أَخْذِهِمْ بِأَحْكَامِ الدِّينِ وَالشَّرِيعَةِ وَلَمْ يُنْقِصْ ذَلِكَ مِنْ بَأْسِهِمْ بَلْ كَانُوا أَشَدَّ النَّاسِ بَأْسًا لِأَنَّ الشَّارِعَ صَلَوَاتُ اللَّهِ عَلَيْهِ كَانَ وَازِعَهُمْ فِيهِ مِنْ أَنفُسِهِمْ This is powerful stuff. I want to argue that Ibn Khaldun took for granted that taraf is destructive of everything it touches, but not when a social grouping develops internal subjective mechanisms to curb and control it. I think that it is not just because his work was concerned with the rise and fall of Dawla that he diagnosed Taraf to be a disease, but it is also because he was not worried about the venture of Islam as a whole, that he did not extend his theorization since Islam as such a totalistic phenomenon was not on his mind. These distinctions, by the way, are not taken to, to be taken for granted in scholarship that is uh, out there. I think Ibn Khaldun, like all his Islamic counterparts, took it for granted that the Shari Sufi central domains are the guarantees for securing a tariff less subjectivity. And these domains were seen by him as enduring and timeless, which is to say that Ibn Khaldun saw in the Islamic concept of positive liberty, in all its shades and variety, the guarantee for an ethical society that is able to maintain a successful trajectory as so-called civilizational entity, if we want to use that, however problematic this again is. Actually, it bothers me tremendously, but I don't have another language. It therefore behooves us to see Ibn Khaldun as no exception to his Muslim colleagues before or after him. Despite his innovativeness in the Muqaddimah, like him, like them, he insisted on this cultural understanding of praxis, not just practice, but praxis, that's a methodical form of ethical self-cultivation. He insisted on this cultural understanding of praxis, which pervaded all Muslim thinking on both polity and so-called society. I want to argue that Ibn Khaldun's concept of ethics is at one with the common denominator of Islamic culture of what ethics and subjectivity formation are. And this means that the notion of the ethical technologies of the self as positive or individual liberty of a sort should be taken for granted. I say of a sort because the Islamic concept of positive or individuated liberty was still different from its modern connotation, although the general tenor behind it is roughly one and the same. And it is here where we begin to understand why affluence and accumulation of capital and wealth did not have the same status in Islam as it is in the modern West or now in modernity and around the world at large. For the degrading of the individual into a docile, docile subject who is open to state recruitment and capitalist consumerist subjectification become in modernity the sine qua non of empire and domination. In other words, while ethical formation was seen as the condition of possibility for the Islamic polity and civic existence, it was the opposite situation in modernity where ethical formation and the ethical technology of the self were counterproductive for the rise of anything like modern capitalism. Modern capitalism cannot exist with it. Impossible. That's why when, when, the, when, 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 when Europe colonized the Muslim world in the 19th century, the first thing they wanted to get rid of was the Sharia. Because, because the Sharia stood in the way of the exploitation of the market. 
if you couldn't get out the Sharia from the, from the way, you could never control the Muslim market. And that's what they wanted eventually, at least in the beginning. Later on, they wanted to control the Muslims themselves. First, you take the money, and then you take the mines. Sorry for the Brits who are here. I, I know it is, it's painful for you to listen to this, but I think, I think it's time. Instead, the cultivation of the citizen, both as a political and economic subject, is in turn a condition of possibility for the powerful state and what it whipped in terms of colonialist and flourishing econocultural civilization, which Euro-America have, uh, have uh, or has clearly succeeded in doing. As René uh, Guinon once said, the ceaseless and constant materialist striving of the Western individual has become a habitus that is to be problematized in relation to what Isaiah Berlin a few decades after Guinot has termed positive liberty, a concept in which freedom is attained by liberating the self. That is, the liberating the self from need and the, the, the materiality of the world. In his famous essay, Berlin passes over the concept of positive liberty near silence, a fact indicative of the general dismissal of it in Western thought. This concept would otherwise bear much significance for other forms of individuals, uh, uh, for, of individual psychosocial development or for social and political organization. Of course, Berlin's virtual dismissal of positive liberty was directly linked to, to deeply seated fears of Soviet communism, of which he made no secret. But Berlin was also not interested in anything outside of the modern project, whether Euro-American or Soviet. It, if we look at others, like say Guinot, we find that they could appreciate what it means for an Asian culture or system to be grounded in a practice of positive liberty. Guinot's frame of reference was the ancient and long-standing traditional civilizations, that's what he called it. Um, also, he called it the Eastern civilizations. Those systems of acculture, acculturation that cultivated ethics and moral technologies of the self precisely for the attainment of this positive freedom. I would like to distinguish between two sub-concepts of positive liberty to go beyond Berlin. The first of which I shall call invoking Althusser's notion of ideological state apparatus the ideological concept of positive liberty. The kind Berlin, the kind Berlin opposed. So we will give Berlin what he wants, okay? So this is his category. Whereas the second, which I now kind of define, may be designated as the individuated concept of liberty. Sorry, individu individuated concept of positive liberty. This latter is individuated because it precludes the interference of an external entity that con consciously, deliberately, politically, and ideologically dictates the terms of formation of subjecthood. Nobody interferes in your business. This is a highly individualistic enterprise. You have, you have to think of the Sufis. With, with me. Rather, it rests on the individu individual subject's initiative which is to say that its range and depth vary from one person to another. It is the individual who is the only and final judge of whether or not to engage in the process of subjective formation and the degree to which this engagement is to be performed. Because it is of the essence that it is a process in which one operates on oneself. One operates on oneself, this is key. Individuated positive liberty is an autonomous and relatively and, 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 and relative field of play. It's a highly autonomous and relative field of play. It is precisely here where this form of liberty distinguishes and distances itself from its ideological counterpart, which assumes the individual to operate within a political collectivity of some kind. Of course, in, in, in Berlin's mind, it was the Soviet Union who was creating this kind of liberty. The individuated concept 
is not a mere theory or utopia, I'll have you know. A historian can convincingly show that this concept had a venerable intellectual pedigree, which is precisely what Foucault had done, at least in the kind of what is so-called Western sphere, although Greco-Roman studies are not really Western at all. They are actually belong to the East rather than Europe, but now they become Europe. That's another theft, by the way, of colonialism. It's a long story. We can talk about it in another lecture. Invite me once more. I'll talk about that. Uh, so Foucault had done all sorts of in the Collège de France. He, he spent about eight, ten years more uh, talking about exactly the basically effect of the, the technologies itself in the Hellenic Roman world, and asking ultimately the question which he never really perfected in, ans in, in, in asking or answering is, okay, these people were doing something very important. Why have we forgotten about it? That's what really this project is about. Here you go, Foucault. No, Foucault now. You don't need to read it. The concept was likewise put to a thick social practice in Muslim societies, as well as in Asia and others, of course, across the centuries and regions, having been brought to an effective end when colonialism destroyed much of the Islamic way of life in the 19th century. Because in Europe, it was destroyed as well. I mean, Foucault himself would say, oh, all these technologies of the self for, for thousands of years, and now they have, and this is his term, they have faded. And faded is a very general term, generous term. They didn't just fade, they were totally annihilated. This concept of individuated positive liberty has the potential to append liberalism, changing it beyond recognition, and most importantly, subverting the materialist and capitalist basis of its social existence. Put differently, to adopt it is to change the order of things, to change the very epistemic order of liberalism itself, and with, with it, its subjective secular constitution. Obviously, the full ramifications of this concept entail the transformation of the two legs on which liberalism stands, capitalism and the political order of democracy, liberty, elections, etc., etc., that is installed to protect and promote the culture of capitalism and the materialist foundations on which it stands. To put it yet more directly, the concept of individuated positive liberty produces the subject who would inherently and intrinsically refuse, if not shun, the subjectivity of negative liberty, and which, which Berlin defended, and with, with it, the entire economic and political system that it sustains. With this background, I want to return to the questions that Ibn Khaldun raised, or at least the questions our questions that his questioning pushes us to, consult, to ponder. And I want, therefore, to ask, why the tariff of affluence is detrimental to the well-being of the dawla while it is conducive in modernity to the rise and flourishing of imperial cultures? I think any serious reader of the Muqaddimah realizes that tariff in Ibn Khaldun's thought is directly related to Ba'as, military prowess. Whenever there is taraf, there is a lack of Ba'as, which is to say that more taraf, that the more taraf there is in the dawla, the less Ba'as can be attained. That's a correlation. Which is also to say that for Ibn Khaldun, as it was for every Muslim political thinker, the dawla is a limited phenomenon and has nearly nothing to do with the modern Arabic meaning of the dawla as a modern state. But how is taraf responsible for decay and collapse? Taraf has two chief effects that have to do with money and militarism, both being intertwined concepts with the meaning of the executive. Taraf is an efficient means to deplete the treasury to overspend in the way of royal luxuries or luxurious living. It is an overspending that leads to financial bankruptcy. But when combined with another effect, taraf becomes fatal to the dynasty. Namely, it creates the lack individual, lacks individual who also lacks moral courage. Hence the courage, the moral courage of the rightly guided caliphs. remember that. 
And when this is coupled with financial bankruptcy, the military executive leadership becomes decadent and soft and removed from the political and military prowess that the founders enjoy. In this picture, we must be alert to stupendous absences. In this picture, there is a whole world outside of the executive that Ibn Khaldun is not addressing. It is what I have called the civic society. That's the best term I could come up with. The social order that is largely self-ruling and that is self-ruling, and that is a crucial source of income that the executive needs to maintain its polity. This order may continue to operate normally without decay or collapse, while at the same time, the dawla may vanish without leaving on it any detrimental or lasting effect. That's another thing we can have not have in modern, because everything is unitary. If the state collapses, everybody suffers. One, of course, there are always changes and mutations in the civic order when a dawla declines and another rises in its stead. But the changes are not structural, systemic, or radical by any means. And here we must posit a foundational premise about Islamic history, namely that the dawla was never in control of the civic population in the way the modern state is. And or, to put it differently, it really never penetrated the so social order was always an external entity. There was no bureaucracy or biopolitics or biopower to speak of. All of which, which I, that, that was discussion of, for those who yesterday came to the lecture, that is basically the discussion of the lecture yesterday, is the, the effect of biopower on this political entity called the whatever, governance or state, but not. There was no bureaucracy or biopolitics or biopower to speak of all of which, as Foucault rightly argued, are the products of 18th and 19th century Europe. In fact, if anything, Ibn Khaldun, as well as all his Muslim colleagues interested in political phenomena, argued that it is the just and merciful running of the civic order according to the dictates of the Sharia ah, that will always enable a flourishing society, one that can be taxed for the benefit of the Sultanic Dawla, which is mandated to run its affairs through Siyasa Sharia. So the more Sharia based governance there is, the more so-called society flourishes and the more taxes can be levied. And therefore, the more powerful the Dawla may become. So justice and ethics create good society, which creates more money. Look at it, this is a totally different equation of politics here. The problem is when the latter generation of the dawla's leaders engage in overspending that the dawla begins to collapse. So the problem is not in the civic order. It's really, really it is in the leadership in the executive, of the executive. Compare this with the modern situation. And I will be finishing within about seven minutes. Again, as Foucault, Carl Schmitt, and their likes explained, the modern state is instrumental in the production of modernity, of what we call the political a Schmittian variation uh, uh, expanded, expanded uh, um, epistemically by Foucault as the age of biopower. I mean, there is a lot of common, common areas of, of analysis between Schmitt and Foucault. People think they are very different. They are, but they are also very similar in, if you read them in the particular. There is no king now to have his head cut off. The state is society, and the individual becomes the citizen, who is the microcosmic, microscopic representation of the state. The state has both eviscerated and recreated the individual to, mock, to make of him and her a citizen who is identity-wise integral to the body politic. This could never be the case in pre-modern Islam since the individual within the civic order was an autonomous entity, just as the law was, a law that could not be used to fashion state subjectivity. I need not emphasize here the crucial significance of the fact that legislation, properly speaking, was never the function of the dawla. Sultans and, and dawlas came and went, one after another, hundreds of them, without any of them even trying to declare themselves as legislators. Without this power of legislation, the modern state, needless to say, is no state at all. 
And it is through legislation and bureaucratic mechanisms that this state has fashioned, engineered, and remade, and continues to remake incessantly its citizens. So what we get is the national subject who is the product of what Althusser called the state ideological apparatus, one who is wholly in the service of capitalism as entwined with state imperative. Almost every one of us is a state subject in, the, in that sense. And it goes without saying that Ba'as, the Khaldunian Ba'as, despite the stringent military training required in modern times, is no longer a relevant factor. If modern armies enjoy military prowess, it is not mainly by virtue of this Khaldunian Ba'as, but rather by the military technology that advances modern states uh, and advances that modern states have perfected. This, of course, needs money primarily, and this money is procurable through the construction and maintenance of a capital-based economy. To allow the citizen to engage in tariff is in fact helpful and conducive to this machine, since the citizen, the Schmittian soldier of the state who's willing to die for it, is always refashionable as a military machine. This is not to be confused with the Khaldunians, Khaldunian Ba'as, since the modern soldier is skilled in the use of lethal machines and weapons of destruction. The modern soldier is as far from Ba'as as he is close to the advanced and sophisticated weapons of destruction which define him as a modern soldier. To sum up, there is no way for us to understand Ibn Khaldun's theory of polity or polity's decline without understanding the difference between pre-modern Islamic governance and modern, Islamic, uh, modern state structures. Islamic or otherwise. There are two different worlds that run by two. These are two different worlds that run by two different logic. The Islamic polity was never a unitary political unit, making and fashioning and refashioning its subjects and its citizens. The Islamic political apparatus could not enlist the population in the way the modern state enlisted the nation and its citizens. This enlistment, what Foucault called totalization and individuation created a regime of truth that enabled the political to mesh with the epistemic, creating the biopower that was driven by the machine of capitalism. Separate and detached from the ethical, capitalism turns out to be a violent tool, not only externally, meaning colonialism, colonization, but internally as well. It enslaves the citizen and renders him a tool of the state to be trained as a consumer, a materially productive agent, and a soldier all at once. And much more, I just don't want to depress you too much. Uh, the state and its capitalistic associates, mainly the corporation, bank on capital and affluence as motives for domination and colonialism. Money and affluence make the subject who is the subject of both capitalism and the state all at once. The Islamic performative technologies of the self ab initio precluded these possibilities, which is why Ibn Khaldun, like all his colleagues, never worried about it. It is because he and his colleagues were talking about a different concept of the human that they never worried about what the critics of modernity worried about. Thank you so much for your patience. Thank you very much for this illuminating talk. We now have about 20 to 25 minutes for the Q&A session. And uh, technology permitting, we might be able to take a few questions uh, from Pakistan as well. So let's start without further ado. Uh, could somebody just use the mic? And maybe we should have one mic for Professor Hallak and the question here. Yeah, question here. Hello, here.
Yes. because I have a suspicion my 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 theory my hypothesis is that it belongs the 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 uh, um, situation also was shared by all the gunpowder empires the three of them but I think the Ottomans as uh, the, the Ottoman case is a bit distinct uh, because it was it I suspect uh, that's again a hypothesis I suspect that the Ottomans were because of their proximity to Europe remember that once the gunpowder the gunpowder empire start their business we are entering the what we call the age of modernity that's when europe becomes the major player and so the three empires were responding to europe so much a lot and by the beginning of the 17th century uh, uh, this the response was quite robust by the 18th it's almost desperate by the 19th it's total breakdown so you can you can see the, how the history proceeded. So the Ottoman the Ottomans played this interesting kind of they were they had two legs one in responding to Europe totally because they were the on, at the borders of Europe and the other leg was in kind of the Islamic Asia. So they were they are Islamic empire. They are the, the values of Islam in them in the empire were extremely important to them. Yet they wanted to survive as a political entity that was a priority as well. And so what happens is that is that they, 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 for example, they are the first entity in Islamic history that makes unifies the legal system into one legal school. It doesn't mean that the others didn't exist; they were operative, but the administration of the empire, legally speaking, was the Hanafi one. So this is a feature that cannot be explained in terms of Islamic requirements. This is a response to Europe. The, the increase in bureaucratization and centralization was another one. This, the Ottoman Empire is one of the most centralized entities in, 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 in history, period. Except, of course, in the last 200 years of modernity. Nobody beats that. And so in, in that sense, the, uh, the Ottoman Empire was responding in, in, and in fact, in, in the 19th century, that's another story. We cannot talk about the 19th century without saying that actually it was colonized effectively. So the administration and bureaucratization of the empire went from about 5,000 in 1810 to 1,000,000 in 1890. In 80 years, you have 1 million basically bureaucrats infesting the empire. But they managed to live for 300 years, height of it, only with 5,000 bureaucrats. So there are changes like these. But, and that is an important but, the Ottoman Empire never lost its identity as an Islamic empire. It could never eventually, without the pressure of colonization at the end and actual legal, legal and political means, because the Ottoman Empire was colonized legally through bonds and, 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 and loans, etc. It was not colonized. It is the same colonization that happened, for example, I don't know if anybody is familiar with the details of how the IMF and the World Bank went to Indonesia in the 90s and basically re-engineered Indonesia. Very few people know about this. I happen to be personally involved in, I at least witness, sorry, I am never involved in something. <laughs> but, but, but the witness of these, of these atrocities, I lost a few kilos. Uh, while w watching what was happening, but it is it is when I studied the Ottoman Empire, uh, I I see the same pattern. And that's why I tell my students: really, not much has changed since the time of colonialism. We are just doing the same thing, but under either undercover or in different soft ways, soft power. But the, the Ottoman Empire was colonized that way. But the the point here is that uh, yes, it tried to catch up with Europe in certain ways but it could not abandon its identity as an Islamic empire. It required a total, total move, a very totalistic move on the part of Ataturk, shunning Islam deliberately and consciously in order for it to become a republic and rebuild itself, which tells you another thing here. 
is that is that is that the there is an epistemic incompatibility between the forms of colonialism that invaded the Muslim world and the local forms on the ground. The local forms on the ground were always were always under the pressure. I'm not saying they were ethical, but under the pressure of of the ethical. This is why in in three books I insisted between impossible state to reforming modernity. The operative, one of the operative analytical tools there is what I call the ethical benchmark. If you can get away of explaining away or saying, or proving or showing that Islam did not have an ethical benchmark, then again, as I always say, I'm going to submit my resignation to Colombia tomorrow morning. Okay, next. Wait, there's a question from the National University of Modern Languages in Pakistan. Okay. Um, and it's about if they're asking you to elaborate uh, what were the precise ways in which Sharia was a stumbling block for the colonizers. Uh, pre precisely, this is this is a good sequel because it's precisely because because you 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 need a free open market to colonize uh, and to, to, to colonize in the liberal uh, capitalist way that Europe came with. Came with Europe came with an agenda. It it came with a particular uh, uh, um, frame of mind that it developed over about 300 years before it uh, invaded the world. Again, it's interesting that always to, to realize that actually even by 1830, 1840, Europe was unable to control much of the world. It, it, it actually controlled the world only towards the end of the century. And, 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 and meaning it, In, for for Europe to to um, to continue its uh, program, so to speak, that developed with the Enlightenment and its own political and economic developments, which were, by the way, one and the same. The economic and political developments we tend to think of them as two spheres. We studied them as that's that's a wrong methodological approach. The economic and the political in Europe grew grew in tandem, one after another, like a rope weaving itself around itself, and so. In order to, to achieve what we call now colonialism in the name of the liberal West, which is basically open market, right? Uh, uh, it, the, the whole Sharia had to be destroyed because the Sharia is, protect, is, is a pro, pro, protectionism economy. It protects the market because it will not allow the, 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 the powerful to devour the weak. Simple. I'm just summarizing for you 40 years of, of, of an eye to what the Sharia has been doing in all sorts of spheres. We can take literally 50 examples in major legal spheres, and all of them are going to prove the same point. Whether it is hoarding, you know, the punishment for hoarding was really stiff. Without, capitalism without hoarding will collapse, right? But if, if a, a good sultan was a sultan who immediately punished the hoarders in the severest of ways. This was actually literally a, uh, almost a form of kufr to hold. And the Sharia stood totally behind it. Thank you so much. Um, I'm too close to the speaker uh, for a great talk. So uh, since we are talking about downfall of civilizations and, and tariff, um, the Ibn Khaldunian uh, ideology. So uh, since I come from Pakistan, uh, in a lot of textbooks in Pakistan, when we talk about the downfall of the Mughal Empire, uh, there is this narrative, this discourse around uh, the Mughal Emperor being really lazy at the end, uh, Bahadur Shah Zafar getting involved in poetry and uh, not giving enough attention to the state or to, to the ruler, uh, to ruling, you know, like the empire. So how do we see um, that narrative from uh, uh, comparing it to the idea of Taraf in Ibn Khaldun? How do we see what? How do we see that narrative of um, the Mughal Empire being so lazy and so uh, on with the idea of Taraf in Ibn yeah, Khaldun? I mean, nothing, there's nothing surprising about this narrative. It is, it is, it, 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 uh, it is pervasive in the in European discourse in the, about the Muslim world, but also about Asia in general, not just. Um, everybody was lazy. The Arabs were lazy too. Persians were lazy. Indians were lazy. Everybody was lazy. Uh, the reason is that is that there was a cultivation of a particular technology of the self in Europe, not ethical, but rather industrial, that is, harnesses 
and, and it builds, nourishes the individual, individualized, individuated, atomized subject uh, into a, into a, a, a capitalist machine, labor machine. Into a labor machine. Uh, and so, for example, to, to just give you an example, there was no other place in the world that this happened except in Europe. They collected people who are sleeping on the streets, you know, what we call today bums, and they wanted to teach them how to become industrious, productive citizens. So how do you do that? One of the methods, I'm just telling you one, which I find fascinating because it scares the lights out of me, is that um, they put the man, usually it's a man, they put the man in a room under the ground with a pump wheel, like the one that the mule would go around pumping water, but it was in a room. So the flood, the room is flooded. And of course, he has to save his life because he will drown. So he had to pump the water out of the room all the time in order to keep alive. If he doesn't do that, too bad. He drowns and dies. This was a method that the French used, in, I believe, in the, in the beginning of the 19th century uh, to uh, teach people how to become industrious. So the idea that building, yes, they, the Europeans were less lazy than the, the Orientals. But again, the idea of labor and work and building the docile industrial citizen who's like a machine goes from nine to five, comes back dead and the only salvation is to have few glasses of wine and a few other uh, whiskeys in order to kind of uh, forget what happened to him or her during the day. That's, that's the result of what we are uh, witnessing here. Um, yeah, okay, well, that's, uh, there is a whole lo longer story, but we'll go. Through. So, <clears throat> so I was fascinated by, um, by your account of um, uh, Hal, uh, or your Haldunian analysis of the state. Um, and maybe this, um, my question uh, accords with the previous question. Um, that it, what you were saying at the start reminded me so much of um, a particularly strong mode of um, political thinking or a political ideology um, in Western thought um, in the 17th and the 18th century, which is that of civic humanism, which uses uh, a very similar uh, diagnosis of um, an ideal state in which you have um, the hardy uh, citizen um, militia um, uh, pursuing a, a common goal. And then in the second and third generations, there's a steady decline in civic humanist spirit until ultimately there's a collapse. Um, and it's kind of interesting that at that time, um, that um, idea of a recourse or a return to civic humanism was pitted against um, the corroding effects of what one now would recognize as proto-capitalism. So this is where it comes to a peak in the early 18th century. Mm -hmm. So I suppose my question is, because it sounded so similar in a way, is, is what overlaps are there, and forgive me for not knowing this, what overlaps mm -hmm. are there between that kind of Western ideological tradition and the kinds of traditions that you're talking about? Because it, it's so similar and so powerful, I think. Uh, in, in what way do you think they are similar? Well, only in, this, in the sense of, of the prognosis of, or of decline, basically, and the idea somehow also of selfhood and the liberty-loving subject. Um, where, and that is a sense, there is a sense that, that the self is not necessarily produced by uh, its relation to capital um, in, in this period. And so they're pitted against each other in the 18th century, in 18th century England, for example. And that seemed to me similar. So I might have got this wrong, but that's what it seemed to me. I'm afraid if I understand your question correctly, my interpretation uh, of, uh, of what you are talking about is a little different. There is, I can't now recall the author or the book, Pocock. but there is a new, there is, there is, a, is, a, there is, a, there is an old book that was written a few decades ago, now making a comeback, people are commenting on it. I'm so sorry, I cannot remember it. Where, 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 where the argument is that the book was condemned when it was written first, or rather reviewed badly, uh, because it, uh, it was accused of, uh, of capitalizing on the margins of discourse. It didn't analyze the heart of European discourse in the mm. 17th century in terms of what capitalism, for example, is able to accomplish. And then, interestingly, now people are looking at the same book in a different way. Maybe you, you know what I, which book better, remember it better than I do, but I forget the title, but 
but the 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 uh, now the argument is that is that is that this author was actually brilliant because who he could see the embryonic potential thing inside that actually ended up uh, uh, ended up in, in the situation we have today with capitalism that nobody could tell. Because everybody, when they look at classical liberalism, they think, oh, well, you know, now we are in violation of the beautiful principles of classical liberalism. I'm not entirely sure. I'm not so optimistic about the Enlightenment thinking uh, generally, to be honest with you. I'll be frank with you. I don't think it was as, as, as um, pure or as um, well intended as people make it to be. There is, they, even when it is well intended, and we know what, well, what happens with well intentioned sometimes, uh, that it, it ends up to be at the end of the day, and the proof of it is the history that happened now, it ends up to be basically a capitalism that has one of the ugliest faces of, uh, in, in, in human history. Indeed. Yeah. And so, so I, I, I'm, I'm, if, if you are talking about overlaps or between, let's say the, the, the uh, I'm not sure if you meant this, uh, where the, for example, in the 19th century, Islamic forms meet, let's say, the good European forms, and there is an identity or similarity between them. Again, I'm a, I'm a skeptic in this respect. Right. I'm just curious because that's, I don't know. Actually, yeah, so that's why I, I argue for an epistemic rupture. I don't mean epistemic rupture that, you know, we wake up in the morning and there is an epistemic rupture. I'm talking about within a reasonable period of time, which I uh, usually classify between about 19, 1830 and 1880, this half century or yeah. 1870 even, within this half century, the Muslim world went through a total epistemic rupture. Now it thinks of, of the world or thinks the world in totally different terms. By, by evidence, by simple evidence, is that I am a, an avid and long time reader of, for example, the legal works of, of, all, of all shades and varieties. Once 1860 hits the ground, people no longer write in the same way. The language changes, the mentality changes, the content changes, everything. So that literature, which has been around for a thousand years, sorry, 1200 years, suddenly comes to a stop. Once the author dies, the, his own students and children and whoever was trained by him are writing a totally different thing. So I'm not sure which is what, where your question was going, but I'm trying to give you all no, possible no, answers. It's, it's interesting because it, yeah. actually what I was after was a kind of timeline. And because I don't know very much about this, I wasn't certain what dates, what the dates were, but, but now I have it. Actually. Oh, in, in the Ottoman yeah. Empire, it yeah. is really between 18, 1820. Okay. Yep. And 1880, everything was finished. 1820, the beginning of uh, change. Yep. 1880 is when the serious stuff happened and not there is no, what you call it, tipping point that you, they could not come back. Okay. They are in modernity and had to deal with modern forms that they are not, were not familiar with. And for reasons they didn't understand. Yep, that makes sense. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much indeed. Thank My you. pleasure. Thank you so much, Professor. I'm a former student. Um, as in um, renewal of the, the Taraf um, aspect, I don't know if you've come across the theory of concentric circles of power in Arabia, which is essentially that the rulers have surrounded themselves with people with no tribal identity and then put the family outside that circle and also where the ruling class have been rendered into observers where they're one generation before ancestors were actually quite violent people. Um, and that's, you know, almost an extension of this. The ruler can no longer rely upon his family in the same way that his predecessors could. Mm -hmm. And my question to you was um, whether you agreed that the Arab world today is living with the um, trauma of the coupling uh, European imposition of, of the facets of a state with a hangover of of, of Islamic principles. And I think that's a problem throughout the Arab world. Mm. And I just wondered your, your opinion. And then just based on what our colleagues said there um, and what you said about um, the, the citizen or, or the resident in, in early Islamic states being autonomous, a great frustration for the British in the north, Northwestern frontier of what is today Pakistan and, and, and Afghanistan is that every Pathan wanted to be a Khan or considered himself a Khan. Everyone wanted to be, you know, their own man. 
and it remained unconquerable. And it's one of the few examples in the third world of an area of, sorry, not third world, of the, of the, of the, of European attempts at colonization, which failed because people were so, and remain so, autonomous. And I thought to mention that just given that this is a OPP uh, event. Thank you very much. Sure. I, 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 I'm, I feel more competent to answer the first question. Uh, and considering, uh, Considering the, the limitation of time, I think the first question actually has a lot already to say. I'm, I, I disagree with the presuppositions uh, of the question, if I may. Um, I mean, needless to say, with the havoc that colonialism wrought on the Muslim world, it's a form of abuse. So subject anybody to abuse, right? Whether they are five-year-olds or 30-year-olds, give them enough abuse, they are going to be traumatized. The question here that so this is this is not we're not going to discuss this one. The question is whether the Islamic past is part of the trauma that you are supposed to, to, to speak of trauma is a serious business. For example, the mess we are in now in modernity, we have destroyed everything we have touched, is the product of modernity. In my dictionary, I consider modernity a traumatic reaction to what happened in Europe at the hands of the church and the absolutist monarch and feudalism for, for a thousand years. Modernity is a traumatized result. I cannot see this in the history of Islam. In mod in, in modern Muslims are not traumatized because of their past. What is happening here is that there is a transference on the hands of modern Muslims in order, because modern Muslims, especially Arabs, are uh, psychologically aligning themselves with the European experience in order to actually escape the responsibility of carving for themselves a separate identity that is responsible and that needs action on its own, an autonomous action. So it's the easiest path to say, no, well, the West already charted the path, let's be like the West. The, uh, this is multi-layered phenomenon. It is both conscious and subconscious. It is both psychological and economic and, uh, you know, it's liberal, of course. Yeah, Muslims now generally are more liberals than liberals, more Catholic than the Pope. Uh, but, but, but also something is happening that very few people give enough credence or uh, sufficient analysis to, is that Muslims with the passage of history, meaning the passage of the decades, especially since 1980 and 90, are actually carving for themselves, carving themselves in the historical as, 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 as integral to a historical narrative, carving themselves as duplicates of the Europeans. I am fortunate enough, this is one of the fortunes, I see one, two gentlemen who might be about 10, 15 years only younger than me, but I guess I'm probably the oldest one in the, in the room. I was, I lived the times when Muslims never, sing, no, not, not a single voice I could hear, condemning the ulama for hijacking Islamic history or for corrupting Islamic history or for abusing Islamic history or such. There was not, no discourse like this when I was young. When about 2000, 1990 hit the ground, the voices begin to proliferate. By 2010, 2010, and now especially, Islamic history is, if look at, look at it, only 40 years ago, only took 40 years ago to make Islamic history almost identical to European history in terms of church abuse and monarchical abuse. So Muslims are actually, as I teach, when I teach as, uh, the modern, modern uh, narrative, especially the political one, uh, Sayyid Qutb and around Sayyid Qutb and Maududi and such, actually I tell my students, and forgive me for this, you may be not happy with what I'm going to say now, I say, actually, Muslims nowadays are becoming more Christian than Christians themselves, themselves because of such habituations into psychological discourses where they become identified with a history that they never had. It is a European history transposing itself, copying itself on the trajectory of Islamic history. If you actually think about what happened really, in, and this is the subject of my next book, the idea that there were sultans, some of them, of course, were abusive, and which ruler, which society could live with all 
we have our Nixons and our Trumps and our, I don't know, you Brits can tell me your own, you know, I see, I see what's his name on the, on the, with one horn and one halo. So I, you know, I was, I was, I, you saw that, right? In, on the buses. Uh, leader, political leaders can go either way. There are people who are extremely dangerous. Trump is worse than the worst of sultans that Muslim history has, uh, has, has, has known. Because he almost brought the whole United States into, into a collapse, really. I, not just collapse, political collapse and democratic collapse, it may, even maybe more. So nobody can come and tell me, oh, well, there were some sultans who were not just. Okay, tell me something I don't know and nobody knows. That everybody, some sultans were not just. Yes, some of them were very bad. But many others were extremely good. And there was a paradigm where they were good because of that paradigmatic institution, which uh, made them just. And where you can read this, uh, I'm an avid, for example, just to give you an example. I'm an avid, avid, avid reader of the Mamluk uh, Annals. About 260 years, it's not too long, but it's long enough. I read every Sultan in detail for many times over in my life, what they did and what they didn't do. Well, on average, I say, well, actually, it's not too bad. Some of them were nasty, but some of them were actually admirable. And the admirable ones, by the way, tended to be the ones who ruled for 30 and 40 years. The nasty ones didn't manage to stay too long. So I'm, I'm not sure I agree with the presupposition of the, uh, of the question, my good friend. Forgive me for, yeah. Because of the shortage of time, uh, we're going to pursue just this one final question from um, Arab uh, uh, What is the case of this integrity group? Resistance? Resistance uh, against the power structure. Resistance against the rulers. Okay, well, this is again, um, it goes to similar um, themes that, the, the, that question or that discussion raised. Uh, Ibn Khaldun, there are two parts to this, to the question. To the, uh, one is that Ibn Khaldun understood what everybody understood in, in Islam in those days when they understood how the dynamics of power worked. Is that you are, you are not good as a sultan, and you are risking, first, risking the dissatisfaction of the dynastic house. Dynastic house was very complex. Now, it has not been studied, by the way. It's, a, it's not just Sultan. It's, as I said in the lecture, it's a very complex thing because it involves a number of people, could extend up to about 40 and 50, who are all involved in the decision of what is the Sultan it should be. So you are risking, first, dissatisfaction of these people, because your mother could kill you. Uh, your father could kill you. Your uncle could tell you, you know, move away. I am going to step in now. You are still not uh, mature for this uh, stuff. You, you need to read these books and you will see what I'm talking about. Everything I'm telling you is documented like multiply in the sources, right? Uh, the other thing is that as um, uh, uh, Amir al Anbari, uh, I think the name, this contest or uh, some, uh, um, the, the beautiful book uh, um, about, dem the, about demonstrations and contestations of the populace against the rule. It, she shows very nicely there how, in fact, the population rose against everything. Uh, once they see something unjust, even a tax that is imposed, but that was not like shari or too, too, or too high. They went onto the streets. They, they, uh, the Sultan was always in a vulnerable position. Sultans were weaker than we think they were because they always are looking at first, is there first somebody else in the, in the house who might replace me? Second, even if not, there is always a contending some dynasty there whose who, who's, 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 uh, venture to reconquer or conquer the dynasty, dynasty, existing dynastic house can be attained by some uh, general is not loyal to this uh, bad sultan, right? And the population. So in other words, the, the balance of power was so delicate that no sultan could take for granted that they can do what they want without, with impunity. 
they always, every day, every day, not, we are not talking about four years where I know I'm selected for years, I can do anything in the four years. I can move my embassy to Jerusalem without any consequences. So because I have four years. No, they had to think about it daily because within the next week, another general in the trusted general say, okay, you are going the wrong way. There is some other fellow contender, we call him, who's coming in. They go for the contender and suddenly within maybe a year, everything is changed and the new dynasty settles in. We'll, um, we're receiving literally dozens of questions from Pakistan. It's huge interest to people. Mm. Look at the, the I answered the only part one of the question, but, but that's think, good enough. I think you will have to visit Pakistan in order to <laughs> engage with these audiences. Uh, with pleasure. Um, uh, but we'll, before we draw this to a close, I'll really um, welcome your patience for literally two minutes. We are going to have a vote of thanks from uh, the principal of Lady Margaret Paul, Mr. Christine Gerard. And then uh, the uh, supporter of our lecture, um, uh, Abdul Ghani Dadaboy, will distribute uh, the gift to this. So, <clears throat> thank you, Professor Halak, uh, for such a stimulating, thoughtful, um, and energetic lecture. We've been honored to have you as the speaker uh, for the very first Mohammed Iqbal lecture a brilliant way to introduce what I know will be a distinguished series. The LMH has been very proud to host this event. We as a college uh, have a, a long and distinctive association with Pakistan scholars, including your former prime minister, Benazir Bhutto, and of course, Malala Yousafzai. We have a close association with the Oxford Pakistan programme through the LMH Pakistan Initiative, which is successfully and incredibly energetically raising funds for graduate scholarships and awards to enable talented students from Pakistan and of Pakistani origin to study here at LMH and Oxford. The lecture series, with its emphasis, as yours has shown, on the rich diversity yet interconnectedness of different cultural, political and spiritual perspectives, accords with the role Lady Margaret Hall plays as home of the university's chair of Abrahamic religions as well as, I think, with its broader emphasis on diversity and inclusion. So thank you very much once again for such a fascinating lecture. Uh, and we do hope uh, that as many of you as possible will stay on the reception afterwards. Thank you. Thank you. I would now like to call uh, Abdul Ghani Dadaboy to say a few words and get to get. Gentlemen, on behalf of Dadboy Foundation, in supporting the Oxford Pakistan program, uh, the Oxford Pakistan program is a great initiative. And I would like to uh, convey my gratitude to Professor Adil, Dr. Talha, Harun Zaman, Manail Sakib for bringing this platform into a successful reality. Uh, finally, I would like to thank Professor Wal Lak for accepting the invitation for the inaugural lecture series. On, on behalf of my foundation, I'm grateful to the OPP and uh, Professor Lark for a wonderful event. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, wish you a, a wonderful evening. Thank you. I'd like to call Richard Hunt as well um, to uh, get a souvenir from Mrani. Uh, is Honor still around? Uh, Michael, we have a gift, for, a souvenir for you as well. So whenever, whenever uh, after this meeting, we'll uh, we'll give it to you. Honor. Uh, So Anna has been uh, fundamental in organizing this lecture and uh, we have been sending her a lot of emails and she's been kind enough not, uh, not to get uh, annoyed with that and been very supportive. On behalf of the Oxford Pakistan program, 
I would like to thank all of you who are here in person and have joined us online. I would especially like to thank Arun Zaman and Minahil Saqib for part of the OPP team and have put in a lot of hard work to make this event possible. To conclude, I would leave you with a couplet by Ilama Muhammad Iqbal, which sums up the essence of OPP. Jahane taza ki afkare taza se hai namood, ke sangu khish se hote nahi jahan paida. New world drive their pomp through ideas fresh and thoughts new. From stones and bricks, a world was never made nor grew. Thank you so much. Just want to let everyone know we have a reception. Anybody who's, who wants to join is in the neighboring room. Thank <laughs> you.